Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome and aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going to go across a turbulent sea, a turbulent economic sea, and talk with my guest, Roger Epstein, about building bridges over that turbulent sea. Roger has been working with businesses in China for about 45 years. He has formed a company called the Asia Pacific Group with other American business people to assist Chinese and Americans invest in each other's country. Roger has recently returned from Beijing where he spent several months teaching at Beiwai Foreign Studies University Law School and helping the Asia Pacific Group develop its business plan. I have asked Roger to give us his insight on the current and the future prospects for cross-border investment for both China and the United States with each other. Roger, welcome. It's good to see you. Welcome back. Uh, how are you doing? Terrific. Thanks, Mark. So nice to be here. You know, there was a notice that came on my uh, internet this morning that stock market plunged again because of tariffs. Uh, what's going on? What's going on with the, between China and the United States? What's the economic climate like? Where, where, where are we? What, what's the current status? You know, uh, interesting. I, uh, I, I was in China this year, as you mentioned. In February, I went and began teaching for four months in Beijing at this uh, Foreign Studies University, which uh, has a lot of diplomats there. A lot of the, about 70% of the Chinese diplomats were trained at that school. Mm. And so they're all thinking uh, uh, internationally. And the United States has always been a huge focus for not only their lawyers, uh, but uh, the whole school. Uh, they, they do teach 93 different languages there. Huh. Uh, uh, but I was teaching two classes uh, in legal writing in English using American case law. Hmm. And another class uh, to graduate students on U.S. tax law. Wow. So what my perception in the many years, I've been going to China since 1982, Hong Kong since 74. And uh, as you well know, for the, since 2011, I've been going twice a year for our lawyers program, where we were bringing lawyers to the United States to stay here for three months, Chinese lawyers. And my perception has always been that the United States is the model for China. That's what they want to be. All their development, everything they've done from 1978, when they got off the communist program and got into what they call socialism with Chinese characteristics and began to let people own property, it's always been about how do we get to where the U.S. is. That's what we want to be. You see people walking around China everywhere wearing t-shirts in English. They can't even understand it, some of them. I had a friend, uh, you know, King Word Gan. I had a contest one time whether his three-year-old son's Chinese was better than my uh, his three-year-old son's English was better than my Chinese. So that's how important the United States is to them. And my students were shocked, literally, when uh, they they began to see uh, Mr. Trump, President Trump adding these different tariffs on. They were they were disappointed. Shocked. They were confused. Okay. Uh, uh, what, what's the United States trying to do? Uh, uh, what, what do they want? And uh, uh, what's the goal? And why are they doing this? Because they felt they were a good partner or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Right? They, okay. they, their sense was uh, what I would call uh, uh, competition. I would call it business competition. Uh, so. Uh, we want to emulate you, we want to get better, we want to be like you, we want to collaborate with you, we'd like to learn from your technology. You are the master. We are the student. Now that's gone 
from 1983, when they first started having laws there, uh, to today, 35 years later, uh, uh, they're catching up. But the standard of living in China is not as good as it is here. Yet people are optimistic. And here, our standard of living is higher, but it's going down and people are pessimistic. So what I see is, uh, uh, as I said, I was teaching two classes in legal writing to undergraduates, law school's undergraduate there, and they, we were using American case law doing this in English. So I'm just trying to give you a feel. So their for, goal is to, is to emulate yes, America. Yes. And you know, in history, uh, and there's a number of books recently out on this, about how things change economically. One country like the United States has been dominant for a long time, particularly since after World War II. Uh, we were the supreme uh, economic power in the world and one of the two major uh, military powers and then the major one. And then it, we can't sustain it forever. So we begin to come down. The Chinese are the, are the new guy on the block starting to come up, and how do we deal with it? But there, and there's investment from China in the United States and U.S. in China. Enormous. What, what's happening to that? Enormous and, investment. Uh, with, with respect to these tariffs? What's well, with respect to the tariff, the, first of all, the, the, the investment in China uh, with the big multinational companies is huge. Everywhere you go, you see Starbucks, you see uh, Colonel Kentucky Fried Chicken on every corner. And so our investment there has been enormous. Uh, uh, now, the tariffs have had, uh, uh, like I said, kind of a shock treatment. I think this is President Trump's approach to things. When he wants to have a discussion, he slaps you in the face, and then he says, well, let's talk now. Yeah. And so hopefully, strategy. hopefully he has a strategy, because as you know, Everyone advising him said, don't do this. It's a mistake to put tariffs on Chinese goods. If there are things China's not doing, let's sit down and talk to them about it. But that wasn't his program. So he began to put tariffs on in uh, January of this year, and then more uh, in uh, uh, March. And uh, one of the impacts in the United States, of course, is that China began to put tariffs on imports. From us to them. Exactly. And the agriculture is taking the biggest hit. U.S. agriculture. U.S. agriculture is very, very concerned. Uh, uh, in order to mollify them, uh, we created a program where we, where we, the United States government, uh, will give up to $12 billion in uh, uh, support to farmers. The soybean farmers can get something like $125,000 maximum. There's a lot of conditions and, on it. And that's because the Chinese retaliated with their own tariffs exactly. on that type of product. Exactly. So you say to yourself as an American, has this helped us? <laughs> uh, uh, Chinese goods, the prices have gone up, so that hurts the consumer. And a lot of it's technology type products too, as I understand it. Uh, there's a whole range of product, products that, that, that we've uh, uh, put tariffs on and a whole range of products that they've put tariffs on. And uh, uh, the, the agriculture industry has gotten hit by far the worst. So I said, we could give back $12 billion to our farmers. And you say, well, but we just cut taxes. And the Republicans keep saying government is not the answer, it's the problem. Mm -hmm. And so how does... How doesn't does, quite make sense. It doesn't make sense. So what you hope for is that there is a strategy Huge tariffs are coming on in January of 2019. I think it's $200 billion worth of goods that we import from China is going to come on as a, a, with tariffs up to 25%. So that means the cost of every product would be raised 25% to the mm -hmm. consumer. But the G20 is meeting in November. Of this year. Of this year. And a lot of discussion about leaders of other countries saying, can we get China and the United States together to mm. solve this, what the, everyone is now calling a trade war. And, and that's because this trade war affects the whole world. Of course it affects the whole world. And uh, the United States and China are the two largest economies in the world, and there's so many spin-offs from everything they do. And uh, it, it's very, very worrisome that prices are going to go up on goods, 
that we're going to be uh, uh, prohibited from selling some of our goods in China. Uh, China has already uh, adapted Chinese importers. They've adapted, first of all, uh, imports before the, the, the tariffs were announced in four brackets so far. I think January, March, July, and September. And just before the tariffs went on, there was a huge surge of it, buying. Uh, buying. Uh. And then all of a sudden it dropped off a cliff. And so uh, you can see, people know what's going on. What's the other thing you do if, if you're a Chinese seller? Uh, or if you're a Chinese buyer of our agriculture? Well, you look for another supplier. Right. So what's going to happen? Are, we gonna, are our exporters, are our farmers who are exporting something like $140 billion to China, are they going to have other markets if the Chinese find somebody in Brazil or, or, or wherever around the world to buy their soybeans. Okay, now look, also China, Chinese investors were coming to the United States. Have, have you noticed any change in that? And vice versa, Americans uh, ma making investments in China, uh, have you noticed any, any change in that? You know, the biggest impediment to Chinese investment in the United States has been uh, the unwillingness of the Chinese to, to let people get their money out of China. It's very difficult. And uh, if you have a legitimate business, uh, you can go jump through a lot of hoops and get money out. But that's been going on all year this year and some of last year and continuously off and on. But they've gotten much tougher this year. So that's been the biggest cause. Whether the, Im the investments here, not the imports, we know they're going down uh, because uh, the products aren't as competitive. People aren't going to buy as much. And so they're going to look for other markets for their goods. Um, uh, I, ha I, I haven't seen anything that indicates that the investment in the United States is going down. The Chinese still want to invest in the United States. Is I think the Chinese that? still want to invest in the United States. Okay. Uh, I think it's been difficult for them. Uh, 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 we've, we've changed the playing field. Uh, do you know what CFIUS is? What's that? It, it's a government organization that looks at whether or not foreigners can buy companies in oh, the United okay. States. Uh, Larry Foster is an expert in this. Uh, whether they can buy for security purposes. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a, a, a number of potential acquisitions. So some of what the Chinese want to do uh, uh, my basic experience is what, what they want two things from the United States. They want technology and they want money, U.S. investment. And there's a tremendous encouragement in China for U.S. investment. Um, coming into China. Coming in into States. China. Okay. U.S. dollars coming in and other countries. But the United States, of course, is the biggest market in the world and we have huge financial institutions and investors. So they want U.S. dollars and they want U.S. technology. They want to grow. And so the, this, this trade war yeah. that we have going on has not affected the psyche of the Chinese man on the street, if you will. The, the person, want, you know, the businessman wanting to make investments still wants money coming from the United States. The United States still wants to seek out investments in the United States, but the climate, yeah. the sea yeah. over which they're traveling yeah. is a little bit turbulent. That's what I hear you saying. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, in, in the inbound direction for the United States, uh, uh, what I said earlier uh, with respect to my students in particular, not so much in the, my particular business, because those are close personal relationships, but in my students who were wondering what is going on here, I think there's some of that uh, with many other people in China. So there may be some hesitancy to invest here. Okay, so there is reluctance, and maybe after the break we'll talk about ways to get over that ocean of turbulence. Okay. All right, so we'll take a break and be right back. Happy. All right. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff, but I really like energy stuff, so I'm gonna keep on doing it. So join me every Friday 
on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on Think Tech. Aloha. All right, welcome back to Law Across the Sea. I'm Mark Shklov, the host, with my guest, Roger Epstein. And Roger, we're talking about really your experience in China, your personal experience, and what you've encountered from talking with all well, your students and your personal friends who are in business. Uh, and you formed a, a company called Asia Pacific Group. I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Uh, how, you know, how are we going to weather this economic storm? What, what is your feeling? How are we going to get through it? How do investors from both sides ultimately get in their ships and travel across that sea and make investments? And then what is Asia Pacific Group about? What's it doing? So, okay. Well, um, I think how we weather the storm could very much depend on the G20 meetings in November. Uh, because if we ratchet up uh, this next 200 billion of, of tariffs that uh, supposed to go in in January, uh, it's got to have a huge negative impact on the mindset of everyone. So it, it, it's a psychological impact it, more also, as well, well as economic. Also, yeah, all, yeah, not, yeah. not, not uh, also. Yeah. And what I was saying before the break was, look, uh, if you're a Chinese person or you're an American, you got to start looking for other markets. And other investments. And other investments, because, you know, it's like you're not wanted in the United States. Yeah. And, and how protective, Trump now says he's a nationalist, how protective <laughs> does he want to be? Yeah. You know, other people have put tariffs on steel and various products. Other presidents, going back a long ways, and, and Obama put a lot of tariffs on things. Uh, but none of those have really worked. You know, the, in Adam Smith's invisible hand, the marketplace, there's nothing you can do. People want to get do business the way it makes sense. Example, China is struggling now as a manufacturer. Everything you see made in China, but now it's starting to move. Why? Because the Chinese have raised the cost of labor. They've mm -hmm. raised up their own standard of living. They're beginning to price themselves out of the market. People are going to uh, Vietnam. I had a, a, several inquiries about doing legal work for billionaire Vietnamese. Mm. Think about that from 1967, oh, 68. Yeah, yeah. So, so everything moves. You really can't fight it. And, and prices on products here are starting, everything that's made with steel is starting to go up. So I don't think it's sustainable. I don't think the trade war is sustainable. I, I think we got a lot of worries about, uh, you know, we just lowered taxes and borrowed $150 billion a year for 10 years to, for a tax break. Uh, that's made the, the, the uh, it, it, it did have the effect of kicking up the economy, but the economy was already booming. Yeah. You don't do that when the economy's booming. That's like Econ 101. So I think we got to solve this trade war or it could get very disastrous. It's not working for anybody. It's not it's, working it's, for anybody, I don't think. Yeah. And, and there's no question about uh, China started in 78, and they thought they were the underdogs. I mean, they have moved from poverty. I, I, I can tell you, right. I was there in 1982, and I was there a few months ago, and it's like a whole different world. It's incredible. Standard of living has shot up tremendously. The standard of living, the cities, the people, you were on bicycles, and, and uh, you know, it was just a third world country, and, and a lot of poverty. And they're studying, as you say, America. Oh, yeah. Do you know, I, I was at Columbia University a month or so ago. You walk around the campus, Chinese is spoken everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. It's, a, it's incredible. 
so they're interested and they're excited and they're coming up, but they've got problems. Their manufacturing is now getting too expensive. Right. What they're moving into is a consumer goods. Now their people have enough money to buy goods, so it would be good for the United States to sell choice. their products. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 my perception uh, last year and this year was everybody wants foreign products. They don't yet trust their own Chinese products. Right. It's a heck of a good time. Okay, what, what is Asia Pacific Group? Where, what, what is it about? How did it get formed? What's the idea behind it? Where is it going? When, and what can it do to, to help us get over this? Uh... Well, I hope more Asia Pacific groups can be formed and we can do some good with it. I, I uh, uh, practiced law here for 45 years. And uh, when I retired, I, I decided to uh, do a number of things, but go into business with a couple of friends of mine who have long-standing, uh, one is a Chinese national, uh, born in China, an American citizen, uh, who, who f they found the Zhou Enlai Peace Institute. Zhou Enlai was the number two guy under Mao, maybe you call him the Thomas Jefferson of China, and very well respected. And so because of her connections, people kept asking her, how do we make investments in the United States? How do we get the United States to make investments here? So we formed this company, and we're working with, with the government, essentially. Of the, China. Of China. The government of China has something called the Ministry of Foreign Commerce, and they allow certain of their executives to form companies and alliances and go into business, essentially, with other groups. So the Ministry of Foreign Commerce will take us to places where they're looking for uh, a U.S. investment, or they're looking to change their business ways so they can work in the United States, and they'll introduce us, and then we'll go into partners with uh, uh, a Chinese uh, organization and the Ministry of Foreign Commerce and the Asia Pacific Group, and we'll help them to do whatever they want to do: buy goods, sell goods, uh, acquire companies, make investments companies, in the United States. Make investments in the United States. And uh, there's a number of organizations, uh, uh, a Chinese national um, a business organization has 10, 15,000 members, the largest companies in China. We have an agreement with them that if we find good projects here, uh, good companies to invest over there, uh, we'll, we'll uh, talk to them and find some of their members that would be interested. So you set up a network in China, is, yeah. is what I hear you saying, a, a, a good one because it's in relationship with the government, which is important in it is, China. It's more important there. And, and then you look for leads. Are, they, are leads come to you and, and then you try to put them together, you try to match yeah. them? Yeah, the government kind of takes us to these leads for the most part. Okay. And, and, uh, and then we find that we have a, a you know, a relationship is so important in China, yeah. Guanxi, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, trust. And we've seen it all the time. It's hard to trust Chinese people. It's hard to trust Americans. So one of the things we're bringing to the table are people that want to do win-win business, people that want to do business with Aloha, people that not only want to make money, they want to do what's right for the community. How, how about if I'm an American and I have an investment that I'd like uh, to ask uh, uh, Asia Pacific Group to market? Yeah. How, how does that work? Can well, I, I... call us. Uh, we're on the, we're on, call, go to our website, contact us. And uh, we'll talk about are, it. it. Are you trying to do that? Is that part of what, what well, you, you folks uh, are we, doing? Well, we are. We are. Uh, we got a lot on our plate at the moment, and we don't want to get too spread too thin. Right. You got to focus. Uh, uh, but we've got this. This. Uh, we, we just signed this agreement uh, when I was in China uh, in May uh, with this uh, Chinese uh, uh, community chamber of commerce uh, business organization. And uh, we'd like to start sending them some, some really good uh, potential investment businesses. Again, they're looking for technology. Uh, they've got a lot of money that they'll put into it if it's the right technology and, and, and we find the right partner. So I don't feel that at this point the tariffs have been so negative that they, there's any chance that that business will uh, not continue to be available. So, now, so things could get worse. It has, it has affected people, like your students, yeah. somewhat. They don't understand why we're fighting. Yeah. And, but they, they, the business people, I hear you saying, still want to proceed. The, the seas are rough, 
but but let's let's try to get in the boat and get over right. it back and forth. Right. Is that, and is you that? know, yes. And you know, uh, uh, most American businesses are still very interested in doing business in China. Businesses will do business if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as I said, okay, so here's an example. Uh, we've got a company in a town called Lai Wu, the whole community. Uh, Lai Wu is the largest ginger and garlic manufacturer in the world, or in China. I think it's in the world too, but anyway, in China. And so uh, uh, we connected them with the people that have Canada Dry uh, ginger ale. And uh, it's, now, it's now Coca-Cola. <laughs> and so we're trying to, and in Lai Wu, if you set up a plant there, they give you free land, they give you a tax holiday for 10 years, a lot of incentives from the Chinese government. Now, is that gonna change if we get into a more serious trade war? I don't know. But I, I think business, unlike government, is always looking for ways to uh, expand and uh, China still has a lot of growth to go. So business might be more of a global, globalist yeah. society yeah. as opposed to a nationalist. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It's interesting yeah. because business is so influential on our politics today. But on the other hand, um, do they want to fight or do they want to make money? And I think it's pretty clear that they'd like to expand in sensible ways, make money, and uh, uh, continue these relations. Uh, China is the engine for Asia. Uh, have you ever heard of the One Belt, One Road? Oh, of course. Yeah. So One Belt, One Road is reaching out to many places uh, all over the world. China is making a lot of relationships. Making a lot of relationships. Yeah. And we could maybe benefit. And so you say to yourself, if you look back in history, when the small guy comes up and challenges the big guy, what happens? What does the big guy do? You know what the answer is? They go to war. Mm. That's, that's what these books say historically. When these Now... Are we still back in those ages? And maybe, maybe war is no longer military war. Maybe it's economic and you know. economic war. Okay, now in in the minute we have left, no, what, we have a minute left. <laughs> what advice would you give an investor from China, an investor from the United States at this time? What 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 would you tell them? I would tell them this: uh, uh, people are the same everywhere around the world. The U.S. has a lot of potential. China has a lot of potential. Find people you can trust. Find people that make sense for you to get into business with. Uh, we're going to see more Chinese products coming to the United States, whether there's tariffs or not. We're going to see them. And if you're a, a U.S. person, look for a good person in China to do business with. Same thing in the United States. There's still lots of opportunities. No matter what happens, the pendulum will swing back. But China's coming up, Asia's coming up, and the United States still is the premier place for technology, uh, uh, business organization, and knowledge. And I think there's a lot of good people on both sides that can work through this as it develops. Roger, thank you very much. I appreciate your knowledge. And it's good to have somebody on the ground who's seen both sides and can tell us from actual experience what's happening and the feedback that you get from people. That's very valuable, I appreciate it, thank yeah. you. Well, it's just my personal experience. Of course. And, but I, but it's, it, of course, and that's all we can see it as, and I appreciate that, but it's good to have an insight in, into that also. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right. Aloha, we are PAL for today, and we will be back in two weeks. Thank you very much. <laughs>